How's it going, guys? I'm hoping that this time the sound quality is better. I'm hoping that the stream quality is better. I've tried some new things. Um, so hopefully it's a bit of an improvement on last week's one and a lot of an improvement on the first one. Um, seeing as the first live stream was filmed on my cell phone. <laughs> so thanks everyone for being early. Um, I will start everything properly at about 7.30, but just thought I'd say hello to everyone. Last seen exploring, good to see you. Tyrone Ping, good to see you, man. So today's one is going to be quite interesting because I've been asked this so many times. Um, what camera do I use? What camera equipment am I using? You know, how do I make my videos? A lot of things like that. And I thought rather than making a full blown video, which is not really what my channel is about, I thought this would be the perfect thing to kind of speak to on a live stream. So there's going to be loads of questions from you guys. I know I'm going to show you some of the equipment that I use and I'll answer your questions and stuff as well. So I think this is going to be a really great way for us to do that, get all of that information out in one long video rather than me trying to film something and then try and squeeze all that information into, you know, a 20 minute video. Um, Kabul Brian Dim is saying, just a quick update. Tamalakane River has started flowing again. So if you are to come back to Botswana, especially around Moremi, game park and the Okavanga Delta make sure you got tracks thank you for the advice there because that is actually a trip that Blaine and I are planning so thanks for letting us know and speak of the devil there is Mr. Blaine himself so um, I'm hoping that you know as Blaine is a moderator of the live stream so I'm hoping that if there's any questions and stuff um, that he can answer about Jiminy's and things like that, uh, you know, you can ask him as well and he can give you some good information, especially if you have questions about the automatic transmission Jiminy. Uh, when do the borders open up? No idea. Hi, Eddie from Cape Town. Greetings, man. <laughs> Paras in the Philippines. Good evening from Dubai. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So guys, I think maybe from next week, I might move the live stream up to 8 o'clock um, to try and accommodate for some of the Australian audience as well. Um, it just might work a little bit better to include them a little bit more. I think that would be nice. Uh, it also gives me time to relax and eat dinner with my family and I don't have to rush to <laughs> get to the live stream. And I know I chose the time, so it's no one's fault. Um, but I think I might just be making that little bit of a change. So, in comparison to last week, can I get some feedback on the sound situation? Is it sounding better? Sorry, there's, there's quite a lot of a delay from the chat to the live stream. And I don't know if this is a new thing with the new streaming stuff or if it was like that before. Um, Chris Stapps, welcome. All the way from Iceland. Man, that's it must be looking really beautiful now because you guys are starting to go towards summer a little bit, hey? It's a good place to be in the world. Plenty of social distancing can happen there. <laughs> Sound seems perfect. Okay, that's good. That's that's good to know. I'm sure you guys can hear a little bit of my computer in the background, but uh, meh, whatever. It's better than last time. Okay. So we got a couple minutes to go. Anybody have any questions before I start um, going through the whole process? If you've got any, let me know. Uh, otherwise, this is just to kind of like test sound and stuff like that. And uh, I've got, I'm using some new streaming software. So I can do I can do cool things, like if I feel like putting you on hold, I can put you on hold, <laughs> so that if I need to pick my nose or something, I can do that confidently. <laughs> um, and then I've got some other little things that I'm going to use throughout the show, just to kind of make it feel a little bit more like one of my other videos with some foot some footage playing over while I'm talking. Um, so we'll see. We're going to test it out. We're going to play around with it. Um, I'm excited to to do that. And I think one of the things that um, you guys will learn about me and I think was be very relevant for this this 
kind of live stream is you're going to get a little bit of insight into how I film things, why I film things and stuff like that. So I think that's going to be quite cool. And you would have noticed from the first live stream I did, which was just filmed on a cell phone, to the second live stream where I managed to figure out how to get the camera to work, but I didn't have the microphone working. And now we have the microphone working and the camera working. And we've also introduced some extra software just to increase the production quality a little bit, just to make it a bit more pleasant for you guys on the other end of the world to enjoy. So, yeah, I think it's going to be quite cool. That's something that's very important to me when it comes to my videos. I really like improving the quality wherever I can and getting better and better every time. I'm not afraid to make creative mistakes. You know, I embrace them and I look at it as an opportunity to do better next time. So there's been plenty of times where I've uploaded a video and then people have complained that the audio levels are too high and then, you know, the voice is too soft or whatever. And it's just those are the kind of challenges that you go through learning to become a YouTuber and those are some of the things that I'm hoping to kind of cover today and how I've kind of uh, also learned from those things to improve my videos. So I hope you guys are going to hang around. This is going to be a long one. Get comfortable. There's still a bit of time before we properly start. Go get a warm drink, get a cold drink, get a fizzy drink, whatever you need to keep yourself good and uh, yeah, we can settle in and just have a nice, have a nice chat together. I'm in Dubai and wanted a Germany plus a Royal Enfield Himalayan. Can I buy either? Hell no. <laughs> That's a good selection of toys you want there. Hi from Durban. Mzumvele. Welcome. Dmitry Tankov. Warm regards from Russia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so let's see where we're we sitting at. 24 minutes past. Okay, so the next maybe 30 minutes or so is going to be very much so based around the photography and video equipment that I use. So if you have any Germany related questions, I'd recommend trying to get those out now in the next five minutes because I want to kind of um, bang on that topic first and then we can Q&A and just chat and do whatever after that. Okay, um, <clears throat> I hope that'll be okay with you guys. <clears throat> I thought it would be good to have a little bit more structure with the live streams. I don't want it to just be like uh, I'm reading anything. I, I want it to just feel like a free and open conversation and I want to be able to answer your guys' questions. Um, so I think it'll be nice to, to answer questions relevant to the topic we're talking about. 410 Expedition from Canada. Lovely. One of my favorite places in the world that I've never been to. <laughs> I realized the other day that all my favorite YouTubers and content creators all live in Canada. Rikus Peterson, hi from Strand. Also a lovely place. I like, I like Strand, Somerset West Side out there because you're so close to adventures and stuff out near La Crobo and that way down towards the coast. But at the same time, you are still within reach of getting into like Cape Town CBD and stuff. Nice place to live. Hello from Southern California, Borderline Explorer. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got a really nice varied audience today. Where's my Filipino guys? I'm not seeing anyone today. Maybe they're still sleeping. Hi, gents. How have you found the Suzuki SA service slash customer care to date? Craig Durheim, I have had exceptional service from um, my Suzuki dealer. That's the only one I've dealt with. Uh, they do Suzuki Bramley and Suzuki Kalami. I've had nothing but good things to say about them. Um, and I know that they are, that's their reputation in the, in the community is that they, they know what they're doing. They're good at what they do and they out there to support their customers and stuff. So that's really great. Hey, we got Fricky in the chat. Welcome Fricky. Overland Adventurers. Hello from the Lake District, UK. Ooh, somewhere I'm also would love to go and visit. One day I'm going to do my Land Rover, De Land Rover Defender tour around the UK. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I really want to. That's like on my bucket list. I need a scrappy Land Rover Defender 110 that can get me around the UK. And I just want to go and explore everything go up to Scotland, go to Ireland, go do all of the things there. I'd love to just spend six months cruising around. OK, 
Okay, so we got three minutes to go. Sorry, I know it's a long uh, kind of hurry up and wait situation. <laughs> but I, I wasn't going to leave you guys on the loading screen for that long. Um, but for the new people who have joined, you get your turn at the loading screen. There we go. Welcome to the show. Live stream starting soon. Instagram handle, website, Patreon. <laughs> Present. There, okay, so, so Marvin, good to see you here. I, I know I've got a lot of Filipino support, so it's good to see the guys around. <laughs> Michelle De Polo, ciao, you are great. <laughs> Hi from Italy, I love your Germany. Welcome to the show. So I think it's the first time I'm seeing you here. There's a lot of new faces today, so that's really nice to see. Or there's a lot of new people wanting to talk. Uh, so that's great. Okay, so two minutes. I think it's close enough to the deadline that we can kind of get started. So when I first started with Rome Overlanding, obviously if you've watched my one video where I talk about, you know, how I got into Rome Overlanding, how I got into filming and photography and all of that stuff, you'll know that I've been a commercial photographer since I was in high school, which was seven, eight years ago. And um, that's kind of been what I've been doing, where my skills came from. Uh, it's moved and transitioned in the past three, four years into video. And doing that for work, I got to combine that and really learn video properly when I started YouTube and when I started making my videos because every time I uploaded a video, I got feedback from you guys and you know like fix the sound or why is this shaky or why is that so I had this 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 basic knowledge of the video industry I had some equipment uh, you know I had the camera I had all the stuff to get me going and it was just that process now of learning how to use this equipment and how to tell a good story and keep an audience entertained now we stand here and I'm doing a live stream and we almost 50,000 subscribers on YouTube which is amazing and you know I've got to thank you guys for all of that support you know throughout that and I know a lot of you guys started watching my channel because of the Jimny and the whole build and everything and that was such an awesome experience but there's going to be a lot more cool stuff coming up over the next years of Rome Overlanding this is just the beginning and the Jimny is just part one of that whole process so I'm hoping you guys will also join in past when the Jimny is no longer in the garage you guys will still hang around but the things that I'm going to talk about today is what's, how did I do all of this? How did I, you know, start filming? What camera equipment do I use? What, how do I take my photos? All of those things. And what do I do when I'm out there on the trail? So I'm going to try and cover as much of that stuff as possible. And I want you guys to ask questions. 410 Expedition is asking, who was your influencer? For me, there's a couple, right? Anderson Pierre White was a big reason why I got into overlanding because I was doing research on another vehicle and he had done a car review. I found his channel. I started going down that rabbit hole. Once I had found Anderson Pierre White, that led me to find Expedition Overland. Now, Expedition Overland is my big, big, big kind of inspiration. I want my quality of my videos to be like theirs, my storytelling to be like theirs. Uh, you know, like Clay Craft and his team are just, they do really incredible productions. And from, from me, as from a production perspective, I've got huge respect for them because I know what it's like to travel out there. I know what it's like to, to do all of that stuff and the way that they can just push their quality and just have such an amazing story to tell at the end of the day as well. I, I just, I have so much respect for them. So that's, that's who I look up to on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Anderson Pierre White has made some beautiful films and things like that, but he's much more, for me, of a storyteller than necessarily um, like a cinematic. You know, he's got some beautiful cinematic footage and stuff, and he's definitely, his, his cinematic quality has definitely been improving as of late as well, which is really, really nice to see. But his stuff was more primarily storytelling. Um, so, whereas Expedition Overland just had this kind of combination of storytelling and like cinematic production and things like that. But it's because they have a crew of people who are out there doing photographs and filming. Um, it's not just them on their own. So, I see myself and Anderson Pierre White going out there on my own, trying to make the most cinematic and beautiful piece of content as you can uh, with your limited resources of being the only person out there. And that's super difficult. But I'm going to show you guys um, a clip 
now it's from one of my recent trips where I went to Kakakama and this is what I want to kind of get you guys thinking about is like I filmed all of this with one camera and one lens okay and a tripod that's it so I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna play it and um, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this before uh, some of you may not have but here we go So just remember that this is shot on one camera, one lens, one tripod. Every single shot is getting out of the vehicle, setting up the tripod, you know, getting back in the car, driving out, driving back, picking up the camera, moving to the next location, doing the same thing again and again and again and again. So there's a lot of stuff like this here. I drove all the way up the mountain, drove all the way down the mountain, drove all the way back up again. A lot of work goes into that process of making something like that. Now, this is, there's a lot of stuff going on here and there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of things like that and knowing your equipment and knowing how to utilize your equipment to the, to the kind of peak is what's going to make you be able to really get some special footage. You know, you don't have to have the best equipment. You just need to know how to use it. And I think that's something that's, that's really, really cool. Um, something that I've learned from doing Rome Overlanding is having to just improve myself constantly as a, as a filmmaker and as a storyteller. And it's something that I still feel like I've got so much to learn. I'm just kind of getting there. So let me have a look at some um, questions and stuff. Um, Hadrian Smith asks, Hi, have you thought about a car cam? So in my Botswana trip, I actually used the GoPro inside the vehicle but the adapter I used for the microphone didn't work properly, so I was really upset with the audio quality and didn't really end up using too much of that footage. However, once this lockdown is over and stuff, I will be kind of following that a little bit further, getting the correct adapter, and I will have a car cam. Um, I've definitely... Henry, look, what's this? It's not brandy, it's tea. <laughs> I thought it's irresponsible to drink on live stream when our country is uh, in an alcoholic deprived state. So I, I'm paying respects to all the brothers out there. Um, borderline Explorer, oh my, that's a lot of tripod chase. Yes, it is a lot of tripod chase. Now, when I go to the next part of the video, which I will, I don't know if, actually if I can fast forward the video or not. I don't want you guys to rewatch the same thing, but... I will I'll play around with it a little bit. Until today, approximately how much money have you spent on the car? Uh, I'll, I'll discuss that in, in another video. Sorry, I just want to see... No, I can't. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay, so I... Um, actually, I can. I can do anything. No, I can't. <laughs> I'm not going to fiddle with the streaming software right now. I'd rather keep the ball rolling. Um, okay, so... Let me show you, now this, this, is, this is not the camera that I used to make that, that little video. These are not, I've sold my equipment. When I did that video, when I was in Cape Town, and this is one of the reasons why Blaine asked me, he sent me a question on Instagram earlier today, and he said, why did I swap from Sony to Canon? And it's a big thing. Um, I had to fix my Sony camera, I had to send it in for repairs three times to fix the audio jack. Now when I'm out and I'm doing a once in a lifetime trip, and my sound stops working, that's really frustrating. Especially considering I'm a filmmaker and, I, and I'm a vlogger and all of these things. I need my sound to work. That's how I tell my story. So that is something that I just kind of, I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with anymore. And when I was there in Cape Town, the microphone stopped working. I sent it to them to get fixed and they sent it back and it still wasn't working. And I found out on the day, on a shoot, that I was being paid to be there and I, had to be, I was being paid to record sound and the microphone stopped working. And I just said from that day, not a chance am I using Sony ever again. It's just been so unreliable in that sense for me. As a photography camera, incredible. Other, other videographers who are doing it, if you don't need sound, perfectly fine. I've now swapped to, this is my new main camera now. This is the Canon C100 Mark II. Can uh, get a, a nice little, a little looky at that. Okay, on here I've got the Canon 18 to 135mm 
zoom lens, it's the nano focus. This has got image stabilization. The camera has great autofocus. The lens has got great autofocus. So this is my new kind of main camera. The reason why I say main camera is because this thing can record non-stop. It doesn't have a recording limit, whereas most other cameras have a recording limit. So if you are running um, like an interview or something, say for example, I've done an episode with Juba um, from Juba's Journeys where we sat and we chatted about his Land Rover Defender. And then I did a video with Darren from Bush Tech where we sat and chatted about his Hilux. Halfway through, I had to stop the recording just in case it stopped recording and then restart it. Whereas now, I can have those like really great conversations without having to stop the recording. Um, so that's why that is my main camera because it's the most reliable camera. It also has got two audio port inputs with professional sound, all of those things. So for, for me, you can see here, it takes these, these special um, XLR plugs. So I can use professional microphones and things like that. I have these adapted so I can still use normal, normal microphones. And it just gives me backup because I can run two sound sources. I can make sure that I don't lose sound or quality or anything like that. So while we're talking about sound, it's one of the most important things for making videos. Um, people can excuse bad footage, but they can't excuse bad sound. And that for me is one of the biggest limitations for a lot of people to really get people to sit and enjoy their content is if the sound messes out, it really stops that ability to just relax and enjoy the content. So one of my favorite, favorite microphones, and it's amazing and it's cheap. This is like the entry level Rode video microphone. It's this dinky little thing. If I pull off the, the a little dead mouse, this is how big it is. It's tiny. This is amazing, okay? It's really good. It's got really good off axis rejection. It's like 900 Rand, which is like, I don't, I don't even think this thing is like $60 or something. I think maybe it's $60. Like, the, this is, it's incredible. And the level that this will improve your videos and the levels that this will just, just having this little guy is great. But this guy reaches a limitation. Now, if you are vlogging and you've got the camera here all the time and you know you're talking, this works fine. But the second you move away from this microphone, it turns to crap. So what you want to do is when you are walking away from the camera or when I'm talking and I'm walking and I'm doing stuff, I use these little guys. These are the Rode wireless go guys and I've got in this one I've got uh, the lavalier mic so I can just pop this in my pocket and I can have this clipped on here and I can walk around and these wirelessly speak to each other and transmit the sound into the camera so these are like little things like that work so so well um, that it's just like this is not cheap okay if you're starting out you get this guy and you stay close to your camera and you just make it work okay this you're starting to look at two hundred dollars okay for these little guys but you don't need to have a microphone plugged in here oh yeah two hundred dollars for this and then another hundred dollars for them for the lavalier mic so if you've got this guy this little guy has a built-in microphone so you could just clip it here you know and kind of go for it but it's a bit big and bulky and i don't really like using it like that um, but it's good in a pinch because sometimes you leave it in your pocket and you get out your car and maybe you break this thing or you, you know, you, you never know because it's so small and so light you barely notice it. So that can kind of happen and you know, it's good to have a plan B and that's why I like these. I've used this to film an interview where I haven't had the right microphones and I've held it in my hand like this and I point it towards the interview, to, to the interviewee and, and to myself and just kind of turn it like that to get semi-decent sound. Uh, I just want to check a couple questions there. Okay, some car cams up to 19 hours. Yeah, so I mean, I would use a GoPro or something for a car camera. I, I, I would ideally like to use a Canon M50 for a car camera because it's very small and very good quality. Um, Kunrad Oberholster, hi from Cape Town. Do you have a planned story and try to film as you travel or do you just get footage when you see good setting or opportunity? Thank you. This is a great question. So there's two layers to the story, okay, for me. I know where I want to go and I know where, where I want to place myself, right? I can never predict what's going to happen on that trip. So to me, what happens on the trip 
and the feelings that I have while I'm out there and how it inspires me and all of that just happens, you know? And then, you know, sometimes you'll just chat to the camera and you'll just, I, I just let the moment take me, but I can talk the hind leg off of a donkey. So I just let the moment take me and I just talk to the camera and I just put out my feelings and, you know, how it all, you know, how it's going. And then later I'll sit and kind of put that together. So the story for me is when I'm talking, okay? But when I'm driving and I'm filming, I'm planning every single shot. If we think back to that video I played earlier, that sequence, I planned every single shot. So I would drive and I'd go, okay, I've driven this way. Now I need a shot driving this way. Now I need a shot driving towards the camera. Now I need a shot driving across again, or then now back. I need some, some environment. I need some landscape. I need little details. I want to see the wheels. Maybe I'm going to show detail on the vehicle. Maybe I'm going to show myself driving. Maybe I'm going to show. So you constantly, the more clips you can put in and the more stimulation you can give your viewer, the better the result is going to be. Because, but you can't do it in a jarring way. Each one needs to lead into the other, needs to lead into the other. So that's why it makes sense when you're planning, you know, to kind of do those, that kind of variety of shots. So I'm just kind of keeping that in my mind. I'm going, okay, the last shot I drove away from the camera. The next one I need to do this. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit. Rollboss Overland. Hello, Simon. How's it going, buddy? Christine Siebert, what's the best overlander for a teenager? I'm not going to be answering those questions just yet. This is more about cameras and all of that stuff. I will, and Christine, I see your comments about drones. I'm going to cover that now. C100 is way too huge for your Suzuki Jimny. Well, Marcimo, 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 the, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, all I'm going to say is that me getting this camera and me yeah, and the Jimny and having a complicated relationship may have happened at a similar time. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. This is not the reason why I would sell my Jimny. But it is uh, it's a lovely, lovely creature to work with. Uh, that dinky little thing, I'm assuming, uh, Borderline Explorer, you're talking about this guy. Cardioid or omnidirectional. This is a cardioid, super cardioid microphone. So it rejects noise from behind and it only accepts noise in the front for those who don't know what that means. And... It, it pretty much, there's another one you can get called the Video Mic uh, Pro or something, not, the, not the, the new one, but essentially if you're filming that way and you're behind the camera and you talk, it can pick you up nicely, whereas this one, it's going to sound like you're really far away. Um, so there's you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, so Christine says, what about drones? Now you guys will know that I don't use drones, okay? Why don't I use drones? I can easily go and buy a drone and, and do the whole mission. It is illegal to fly a drone in South Africa without a license for commercial gain. I charge, well, I don't charge, but I get paid by YouTube for AdSense, you know, on my YouTube videos. So if I want to monetize a video, I can't have drone footage in it unless I have a license. And in South Africa, you basically need a pilot's license to fly a drone. So you're going to see a lot of people post videos with their drone footage in it. It's actually, if they're making money from those videos, it's actually illegal. And there's huge, huge fines, huge fines. Um, that's why it's not, it's not worth a risk for me. I just obey the law. And we've, we felt that crunch in, on the production side of things as well. You have to have licensed drone pilots. You have to have permits. You have to have all of those things in place, and it becomes incredibly expensive. We've literally had shoots where it is cheaper to rent a helicopter for the day to fly and film from a helicopter than to get a drone. How's that? Um, okay, so Pat Millies, just found your channel by watching a Kalahari video. What a chance that you are streaming. Welcome, welcome. I've noticed that that video today has just boomed in views. I don't know if somebody's shared it or an article has been posted or something, but awesome, welcome to the show. How long to edit and make a show? Well, Hadrian, this is a really complicated thing. Um, say, for example, my Isimanga Liso series, right? When I came back from there, I'd been traveling for eight days, filming every single day, copying footage every single day. Like, every single day was work, okay? So when you come back, like, it, you need a couple days just to have a break from that trip, and it sounds like it sounds weird, but you need a bit of a to disconnect a little bit from that trip and the footage. Then you then I sit and I start going through the footage and making my selections and things like that. 
Um, then I will start kind of putting stuff together to roughly see how the story goes. Then you start thinking about, oh, I mean, how's the colors going to look? Am I going to, you know, what do I want this to feel like? Then I go through it. I kind of put together a rough story. Then I really trim it down a lot because I'm, I'm aware of the time. So maybe when I put together that rough story, it might be a 40 minute video, right? Then I cut it down, boom, 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 to like 20 minutes. That's like my maximum I try and do is 20, 25 minutes. Ideally, 15 minutes is really nice. Um, so it's a really tricky thing. You've got to really cut it down, but you still got to keep the, the sincerity of the video. You've got to really keep the story of the video. You don't want to blabber on too much. I'm a good blabberer. So, I mean, that's, that's difficult for me sometimes. Um, but it, yeah, and then, then you've got to do the music and, and all of that stuff. It, it's, it takes a really long time. It'll take me about a week to do a video, you know? So that's like from start to finish all day, every day, pretty much, um, putting my time in. It'll take about a week. So it's just going through all of that footage and doing that, you know, I'll film for hours and hours and hours. And then it's deciding, do I do one episode or two episodes or four episodes? So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, man. Um, so Ruben van der Merwe, how's it going, buddy? Hope you're doing well. Yeah, it's Pat Millis. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's, that's good to see. I've seen uh, a lot of, I've had a couple articles posted about my YouTube channel over this past week, and I've had a couple email requests for people wanting photos to use for some articles and stuff. So I think it's going to be quite nice for the, for the channel and stuff. Um, do you organize all the terabytes of footage? I'm assuming that's all of the terabytes of footage, TV footage, TBL footage, yeah. <laughs> um, so the way I organize my footage is I just have um, location, which it will be, say, for example, um, Isimangaliso Wetlands National Park. And then in that, I'll have day one, and that'll have all my day one footage. And card, so in day one is card one, card two, uh, GoPro, things like that. So then I'll divide all the things, maybe camera one or camera two, stuff like that, you know. Uh, and then I'll have day two, camera one, camera two, GoPro. Yeah, that's kind of how I'll, I'll organize my footage. So I know I can just import that whole folder structure into Premiere Pro and I'll have all of my stuff broken down nicely for me. Um, you seem to be a perfectionist. Is it a very good trait, but sometimes it has to be hard as well. How to manage this properly when traveling around? <sighs> Mr. Double XL Albatross, you have touched on a very serious topic. I am a bit of a perfectionist, but through my time of being a creative, I've learned also to relax on that, not have so much expectation. Um, there's times when you can, you can just really be such a perfectionist and put in so much work and you upload a video and you forgot to hit render on a warp stabilizer, for example, which has happened to me. I had made a 35 minute video and the second last clip in the whole video doesn't have the warp stabilizer on it. Now, when you upload to YouTube and you pull off a video and you re-upload it, it's never going to get the same performance again. So I upload and when I hit fire, I hit fire. Normally, I don't even watch the video afterwards because I'm nervous that I'm going to have a mistake in the video. So there's some videos that I've uploaded that I've only watched for the first time recently. So it's, it's actually, it's one of those things where it's just like you just hold thumbs and you hit upload and it's just like, ah. <laughs> and then you hope people are going to like it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really kind of tricky emotional kind of, uh, process, but I mean, yeah, it's, it, it is something that when it comes to my other work, my work that I really get paid for, uh, my photography stuff and that, you know, I do a lot of high end commercial retouching and stuff for alcohol brands and on a lot of my photography and you have to be a perfectionist. You have to, you can't leave a grain of sand on a bottle. You can't leave, you know, a water droplet out of place. You, there's just some stuff you have to do, man. And that's just, I love that. I feel like I'm in my element when I get to do that kind of stuff. Um, what lens would you recommend for the Canon M50? Just purchased the camera and loving it so far with the kit lens. That's from Overland Adventurers. So I, I was going to buy the Canon M50 um, instead of the, what I'm filming on right now is the 90D. Um, I just decided to go for a bigger, a bigger camera, but the, essentially they're pretty much the same. And the lenses, speaking of lenses, I've got some here for you to have a look at. So the one that I got for my vlogging stuff and really like wide landscape stuff is this, is the 10 to 18 kit lens. I mean, it's, it's pretty damn cheap. It's plastic, fantastic. It's not the type of lenses I'm used to using. Uh, the lens that I'm shooting on right now 
the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8. Those are the quality lenses that I love using. But I thought I would try some of these guys out because they've got image stabilization on them. Uh, they got a decent zoom on them. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, they, they, they work all right. Face detect autofocus on this camera, because this camera doesn't have the, the new, new autofocus system. So it only has face detect autofocus on certain lenses. So I bought the, this one, uh, this 18 to 135 here, also has got face detect on here. Then I've got the 50mm 1.8 STM or whatever it is. And this is just essentially to have another low light lens that can partner up with my Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8. So I've got two 1.8 lenses and two cameras. So if I'm filming stuff at night around the campfire or whatever, I have a consistent exposure, um, you know, between the two cameras. Also, the 18 to 35 f1.8, I cannot wait to get out and do astrophotography with that. All of my other stuff, all my astrophotography, everything was shot on the Sony a7 III with a Tamron 28 to 75 f2.8. So now if I can go out and I can do astrophotography with an f1.8, that's going to be beautiful. I cannot wait for that. So that is something I'm just like itching to get out there and, and, and do. Um, so recommended, sorry, I didn't even answer your question. Recommended lenses for the M50. You, you're going to need stuff with image stabilization. That's going to be my main recommendation. And I see nothing wrong with these lenses. Okay. But if you're looking for something a little bit better quality and you know, really good autofocus and image quality and stuff. I would look at this Tamron prime lenses with image stabilization. That's going to give you your best bang for buck. They're not too expensive. Um, they've got vibration control and they've got autofocus. I would check some reviews. Um, a site that I use to review camera equipment before I buy it is called the digital picture. I think the digital picture. He does really technical. You'll, when you read those reviews, you'll understand me because I love those reviews. I love knowing every little little fact and detail about the camera equipment I'm about to buy. Um, so what about wildlife photography and videography? Christine, so the good place to start with that is I would say you need to start with a relatively good camera system. You need one of the newer Canons, anything with the new, with the new dual pixel autofocus. Um, like right now, my autofocus on here is focusing on my eye as I move around. It's like, it's, it's really good. So this is a 90D. It's a lot more expensive than, a, you know, kind of starting entry point camera. But with this camera, you put a decent lens on there. Like uh, there's, it's quite an affordable one. It's a 55 to 350 or something like that. Something, something like that. I don't know the exact uh, millimeterage of the lens. But that plus the crop body is going to give you like a 500, 600 mil lens with that nano autofocus. So that's a really great combination. If you can get that package for wildlife and videography, well, videography, maybe not so much, but for wildlife photography and videography, yeah, that would work really well. If you want to film more kind of interpersonal stuff, you need a lens that is going to be from 18 millimeters or 10 millimeters to about 135 millimeters. It's really the sweet spot for filming people and stuff happening in, a, you know, in and around you. Stuff that's like wildlife and stuff that's far away. I don't really have the lenses to film that stuff super well. Um, but I do want to get some. Um, Ashwin PK, photographer, filmmaker from Bangalore, India. Your video is really inspiring. Really wanted to travel after the lockdown. Oh, that's so cool, man. Yeah, the, this lockdown thing just feels like it's going on forever. And I think uh, a lot of people are with you there. We want to get out there and explore and make beautiful stuff, man. Um, Ruben, you're doing good. That's good, man. Good. Yeah, you, your hoodie is uh, in manufacturing. So that's cool. Um, Dimitri, lighting seems to be important for good quality video material. What can you recommend for people just starting filming outside and inside? So Dimitri, this is a tricky one because like you see now, obviously I've got two lights here. I've gone for like the cheapest option of lights. They're called Godox um, SL60s. They are like $170 or something per light, which is like unheard of. It's so affordable. They work really well indoors like this, but they are not the most powerful lights. I've used them in controlled environments where I can control the light. They work great. When it comes to lighting outdoors, the only time you can use lights like this is when the sun is setting and once it's dark. These lights are not powerful enough to compete with the sun and very few 
um, modern LED lights are capable of doing that. They become very expensive, they become very power hungry, they become a lot of things. And that's still way better than the tungsten and you know kind of the daylight options of the big HMI lights and things like that, which is just, that is just old school now. You need to carry around a big generator to power those lights. That's not gonna work. The reality is I prioritize my shooting around sunset and sunrise. That that for me works best. You, I, I film everything. So I film in the middle of the day. I film in the middle of the day. If the footage looks crap, it looks crap. That's it. You know, what, what can you do? You're there. And that's like um, what Albatross was saying. Like for me, I'm a perfectionist. So I get, I get upset if <laughs> the light isn't right and I'm in this beautiful place. It, it upsets me. But at the end of the day, that comes with the kind of the, the experience of being in the game and stuff and doing it is that, well, you know what? That's what it is and that's how it looks. You know, deal with it. There's ways you can try and cheat it. That's why people get more and more expensive cameras. This camera, for example, has a profile on it called C-Log, which the 90D doesn't have. That gives me improved dynamic range. Now, dynamic range means that the shadows and the highlights in the image if you've got a wide dynamic range, you can see both the shadows, information in the shadows and the highlights. If you have a narrow dynamic range, think of a GoPro, you're going to see blotchy white skies and it's going to, the information just isn't there. That's what makes something look cinematic and beautiful is that it's, it's, you can see the whole dynamic range. You can see the highlights and the sunset. You can see information in the shadows. It's not black and white. If you put black and white together, that's contrast. You know what I'm saying? So dynamic range is opposite of contrast the image almost looks flat and then what you do is with that flat image you take that into post-production and then you tweak it just how you like it as an individual as a creative but Dimitri so that's my answer to you is just it's really tricky man you got to use the right time of day to film your important stuff or to capture your important photos that's why people hike and set up camp on the mountain and wait for sunset they get, take their photos, then they do their astrophotography at night, they wake up in the morning, they go for a bit of a hike, they wake up in the darkness, hike to their next location, and they take their photos in the morning. And then they, they do their moving during the day. I do that as well. I move during the day. So I'll do my four to six hours of driving that's boring on the tar. That's what I do in the middle of the day. And I really, I'll stay in camp longer and film my, my content for YouTube. I'll stay, you know what I mean? I'd rather wake up early, film my stuff and have a late breakfast and do all of that and then leave camp and then drive during the middle of the day. Then, because then sometimes you, you get to camp late or whatever, but then you, you might get a cool sunset photo on the road. You might find a spot on the side of the road that's got something cool there and you pull off and take a photo or film something. You, you got to really kind of play it, play it like that. Um... Perinsunga96, GoPro head cam for future road trips. Maybe you want to try it. I don't know, man. I mean, you're going to just be seeing a lot of my, um, <laughs> my sun visor. I don't know if that'll be too fun. Um, do you, Hadrian Smith, do you have another camera for vlogging? So I actually don't do a lot of, hey guys, it's Peter McKinnon here. I, I, you know, and you'll notice that a lot of the, the YouTubers and stuff, don't do that anymore. They put the camera on a tripod and they stand here with a lapel mic and they, and they do their thing. And I prefer doing that. So I do have a camera that if I do want to vlog, that's the 90D. I'll run all my small lightweight stuff off the 90D and I'll do any of my bigger, more important stuff on the, on the C100. Um, Do you have another camera for vlogging? Okay, yeah. Is the journey on Jimny tearing, tiring? Is it suspension comfortable for longer trips? Um, Amaya, now to, I'm going to answer more of those questions later. So just keep that one aside uh, for me and you can ask that again later. Right now, we're focusing on camera related stuff. Henry throws a spanner in the works and says, you can only take one of your current cameras on a trip for both video and photos, which and why. It has to be the 90D because this doesn't take pictures, guys. This is a video camera. It only records. You can take a photo, but it just takes a screenshot essentially of the video footage, which is just useless for me. So the 90D is the all-rounder. The 90D is the camera that I would recommend people buy because it takes amazing photos. It takes amazing video. You can do slow-mo. You can do all sorts of things. The autofocus is incredible, everything. This is not a tool. I would not actually recommend you go out and buy this camera. This serves very specific needs for me. I can record 
huge amounts of footage on here and it takes up very little space. And that's what is very important for me. It's, it's a fail safe. I don't want to have to rely on the 90D all the time. I want the 90D to be my photo camera and my B camera. And I ideally want to do most of my filming on this. The image quality out of this has a documentary feel about it. And that's why I'm very excited to try and use that more. I want my videos to have a certain feeling about them. So it's a, it's a specific tool for me. I don't recommend it for everyone. I recommend the 90D, which is the one I'm using right now. Um, Ash from PK, how do you manage shooting and enjoying the journey? Most of the videos have a variety of shots, which requires a lot of time and effort. You know what, man? I, I enjoy filming. I enjoy photography. I enjoy all of that stuff. So when I'm out there and I'm doing that, it's the same as people love... Some people love going overland. Like I've had people comment, yeah, but you don't even chop your own wood or you don't even... Everybody goes out and does these things for certain reasons. Some people really just love to go out there and just sit and do nothing. I'll get ants in my pants, man. Like I need to be doing stuff when I'm out there. I, I need to be filming. I need to be... It's very important for me. So there's... It is a lot of work. And running out... That trip I did to Kakakama, that video I showed you guys earlier... I got out of that, in and out of that car in one day over a hundred times. Like seriously, I, like I really, I got in and out that much. And it was just one of those things that I was exhausted by the end of the day. You barely eat food and you just bomb out and you sleep. That's it. It's great. And you wake up the next day and you do it again. And you wake up the next day and you do it again. And it's, I don't know, for me, I, I enjoy it. I do need a break when I come back from my trips though, because it is quite tiring. Um... Borderline Explorer, do you use ND filters and are variable any good? So luckily with this camera, I don't need because it has built in ND filters. So if I remove the lens here, you can see in here, if I show you, you can see there's like little, uh, I don't know if I can get it a bit closer. See there's a little thing that kind of goes over the sensor. There's my ND filter. Like I said, this is a specific tool. This is a cinema camera, okay? So it's designed to do all the video things really well. Um, but with my, let me see if I have it here. Mm. I don't actually know where I've put my ND filters, but yes, I do use an ND filter. I use a variable ND filter, and um, that is on, yeah. <laughs> I used to use that all the time on my um, Tamron. What I loved about it is it was so easy to change exposure. You don't have to do any dials. You can just do a smooth uh, exposure pool. So that was really nice for me. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I know that this is a lot of like nerdy photo information and video information for a lot of you guys. But this is something that a lot of people have been asking about. And I know that there's a lot of people who watch my stuff because they appreciate the cinematography and they appreciate my photography. And I just thought this was a nice way to just kind of explain some of that stuff. So now... I don't shoot everything on a tripod, okay? This is the tripod that I normally use, it's right here. Nice and small, lightweight, compact, great for a small light camera, not for this. Do not put this size camera on a little dinky tripod like this, okay? This is perfect for mirrorless cameras and even my 90D, it'll work just fine, okay? But when the tripod is not good enough, I have a gimbal, okay? This is the Ronin DJ, DJI Ronin SC, it is the, again, the little one, I sold the big one because it did, couldn't fit in the Jimny, I regret that, this is nowhere near the same as the proper Ronin S, and I should never have sold it, I have regrets every day, I hate using this thing, it's never really smooth, it's, I don't know, I, I, I can nowadays do more handheld, and that's also the reason for buying this, I mean, look at the grip on this camera, I've got a little, look, oh, I mean, come on, this is like, with image stabilization on the lens, you've got your adjustable eyepiece here, you know, you can really get stable footage with this, you don't need, I don't need to put it on a gimbal. When I do need a gimbal shot, if I'm doing a product thing or something like that, and I'm doing it, maybe need a push in or some smooth pans or something like that, I can use this in the 90D, it does work. It doesn't work with the 18 to 35, but it works with my 50mm, and it works with this, 10 to 22. So that's that's kind of, I use that again, it's a tool that I use when I need it. I try not use it if I can help it. Um, okay, so Jacques van Jarsveld, 
Sorry if asked already, do you use drones? And if so, what kind? I recently got my Mavic Mini and it's incredible because of its size. It's the Jimny of drones. Uh, Jacques, yes, I did talk about this a little bit. Um, I, if I was going to get a drone, I'd get the Mavic Mini. Because um, the, the thing is, what I could do is if I get the Mavic Mini, I don't, need a, I don't need a license to fly it. Even if I got a Mavic Air or whatever, you don't need a license to fly them non-commercially. But I could use it for my photos on Instagram, for example. Because I don't earn income off of my photos on Instagram. But I can't use it in my YouTube videos because I earn an income off of my YouTube videos. So that's the kind of, that's the situation I'm in. That's why I don't use a drone. Hi, what app do you use to edit your videos from Marvin Bilrand? So I don't use, okay, I do use an app. It is an application, but I use a, a piece of software called Premiere Pro. Uh, it's made by Adobe and yeah, it's kind of an industry standard. Premiere Pro, um, Blackmagix, DaVinci Resolve, and uh, Final Cut Pro from Apple. Those are the kind of three standards for editing in the kind of production world. Do you want to give any information about your job which allows you to finance all of this? Also, uh, give you the free time to do it. 144 megahertz. Um, I freelance as a photographer and filmmaker. So I do occasional jobs and that's why I have a lot of free time. But more and more every day, Rome is starting to look after itself. Um, with the help of awesome patrons, people buying merch, the YouTube videos, everything, you know, I don't have sponsors who pay me. Um, I can get equipment and stuff, but you know the financial side of things is very tricky to kind of negotiate with people. So that is um, something that you know we'll be working on in the future. But yeah, essentially, I for me, I would just love to be doing Rome full time. There's a, recently on the on my website on the banner. If you go onto my website, the big banner there, I've got a form that people can fill in, and if they want to go on future Rome trips, right? And so, I mean, if you guys are interested, you can go and do that. Essentially, what you'll do is you put in your name, email address, the vehicle you drive, and the type of accessories you have. And the couple of, oh, I mean, 20 odd um, signups that I got from last week's live stream, it's actually been really incredible to see all the rigs people have. And it's given me the idea of this gives me a way to get in touch with people if they've got a really sick rig that I can maybe do rig walkarounds and stuff like that of their vehicles. Uh, it's my series called Overland Inspiration is what I call it. And um, so that's what's something that I would like to do in the future. And I'm going to be using those as well. If you guys don't mind using that, I'm going to be using that information to find people as well. So it's going to be going on trips and stuff, but it's also going to be a great way for you guys to potentially get your vehicles featured. If you've got something that's really sick and you want to show it off, I would be happy to come sit down with you, find you wherever you are in the world. And, you know, we can sit and chat and film something really cool and show people your vehicle. So that's also something. So if you guys do get a chance, you can head over to Rome, www.romeoverlanding.com and it's just right there on the, the first banner. So 144 megahertz, I hope that answers your, uh, your question. I used to have a job. When I first started uh, Rome Overlanding, I had a job. And when that, my year at that company ended, I left and pursued Rome Overlanding full time and just do a little bit of freelancing here and there. Thank you, Blaine, for the sharing the link. I'm Turkish and you love Rome Overlanding. Yusuf, thank you so much. I love Turkey. <laughs> it's one of my overlanding destinations as well. You should film the animals and nature associated with your travels. Then you would be a good candidate to, make Dav to take David Attenborough's place. I promise. You have the right personality and charm. Thank you, Mr. Albatross. I do a little bit of filming. I don't know how many of my videos you've watched. I do a little bit of filming of the wildlife and stuff. Um, it's not my main, main, main interest. Um, definitely my main interest is vehicles and overlanding photography and video and stuff, but I enjoy the experience of seeing the animals, but I wouldn't go out of my way to sit in a bird hide for three hours or five hours or seven days to film a particular bird. Hello from Malta. I enjoyed watching all of your videos. They're amazing. Can't wait to see more. Keep up the excellent work. Thank you so much, Robert Portelli. Thank you for joining in and you know, tuning into the live stream. Um, how do you get, how do you get footage in the rain? So that is a very good question. And now that is something that comes down to buying the right equipment. First of all, now, another reason why I bought this camera is because this camera is built like a tank. It has weather and dust sealing the same as the 90 D they have weather and dust sealing. I don't have a lens that has weather and dust sealing just yet. Now a lens and, um, a body combination that has weather and dust sealing can function fully 
in the rain. So that's the, another pro to buying professional equipment. The difference between an M50 and the 90D, weather and ceiling, plus a bunch of other things. Difference between the EOS R, because some people will say, well, Adrian, why didn't you buy the EOS R? Um, it's, you know, it seems to be a lot better than the 90D, and it is in a lot of ways, but the weather ceiling is not as good, and the actual build construction of the thing is not as good. I know a 90D will last wherever I take it, throughout Africa, wherever I go on my adventures, that thing will last. They are built like a brick, and so is this thing, and I'm, that's why I bought them, is because they are going to go and see some serious abuse over the next couple of years. I want to be able to take this camera and give it to somebody who's never filmed before and say, point this thing at my car, I'm going to drive. <laughs> you know, because sometimes I have to do that. Sometimes I don't want to put it on a tripod. Sometimes the situation doesn't, doesn't lend itself to having a tripod. Sometimes you just got to give it to somebody else and just say, please point this at my car. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that. And I mean, the, the, the shoot I did with, uh, with Juba, it was raining like mad. I was literally, the water was just pouring off the camera. Luckily I had, you know, a sealed camera and a sealed lens at the time. So it was really crazy, but I would just take my cap and I just put it over the lens just to try and like uh, divert some of the rain away. But obviously the water gets on the ND filter and the lens element and stuff like that. You get lenses with special coatings that are repellent to water as well. The more professional lenses. I think it's a fluorine coating. Um, but yeah, so, okay, let's see. What have we covered? We've covered, oh wait, there's one more thing in the sound department. And it's what's here. Uh, I don't want to mess around with it too much, but okay, whatever. I have a microphone here, and this is my podcasting microphone. It is my um, voiceover microphone. And this is a very, for me, an important part of my show. A lot of people will comment and say they really enjoy my voiceovers and things like that. And it's important for me to try and get a good quality uh, voiceover. This is not the best microphone in the world, but it was affordable when I, could, when I bought it. And it's done a pretty good job so far. And I'm using it right now. I've got it on a stand. So when I tap the table, it doesn't make a noise for you guys. Lots of little things to consider. But essentially, you know, all of these little components come together at the end of the day, plus my knowledge and my experience and, and that stuff to form what you guys know as Roam Over Landing. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work and effort. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of work. And I would say to anybody who's wanting to kind of get into it, just learn all the time. Watch YouTube videos. Watch, you know courses do do all sorts of stuff that you can to kind of learn more because there is so much stuff but most importantly is just go out there and keep trying and keep creating and keep practicing because that is going to be the thing at the end of the day there's nothing like learning from experience you know um it is one of the best teachers and you know i've spent hours i didn't go and study photography i didn't study filmmaking i learned everything from google you know just from watching youtube videos and I've done that with everything. I've learned everything about overlanding through watching YouTube videos. But there's just certain things you need to learn by going out there. I've watched all the overlanding videos I can watch. I've watched every single one of Ronnie Dahl's videos, every single Expedition Overland, every single Andrew Simpia White video. But I still go out on my trips and learn something every single day. And that is something that is really important, you know. You can only sit inside for so long watching and learning. At some point, you have to summon up the courage to go out there and do it for yourself. So I kind of hope that you guys can see, like, I don't have any really fancy stuff. I mean, there's like, everything that you've seen from me hasn't been filmed on this equipment. I could have filmed it very easily and done all the photos and everything on that 90D. I could have done it on even a smaller camera, in, on the M50. It may not have the same crispness about it. It may not have the same, like, really like high-end polish to the, to the imagery because of the, the sensor limitations on that M50. But you can really go out there and, and do it, man. You can, honestly, the main thing that I would say that makes your footage look professional versus an, like not an amateur, but, but amateurish or, or a hobbyist is using manual exposure control. Not letting your exposure fluctuate automatically. There's nothing worse than you trying to do a beautiful shot and then your exposure changes. Now what happens is now your viewer is not seeing the shot. They're focusing on the exposure changing. Okay, maybe that's just me. I'm focusing on the exposure changing. The other person maybe doesn't even notice. But for me, that, that creates that seamless interaction. Yes, you can go through my videos and there have been times where I've used that functionality. 
Um, and, they, and I've sat in the editing room and I've regretted it. Uh, and I've said to myself, you know what? I should have just used manual like I always do. The shortcut doesn't work. You, you have to do more work later or it messes it up or things like that. So it's, it's really tricky. Okay, H Gamers is asking, show, please show your Jimny. Okay, fine. I planned this just for you guys. I don't know how to do it. There we go. I think I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, there's some. So this is just some photos. Okay, just going through some of my experiences and some, and my trips and stuff. There's a Jimny, a little sneaky Jimny there. So obviously astrophotography is a whole nother topic to talk about. But you guys can ask questions if you have questions about astrophotography. Ask away. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you guys the slideshow. These are the uh, Patreon wallpapers, so you're getting a sneak peek at all the Patreon wallpapers. Um, but if you watch these, look at these photos quickly. If you have any questions about any of the pictures or how I've done what or, or what, this is the time to ask. I'll answer all of your questions. Um, what we'll do now is we'll shift into Q&A about the photography and videography stuff. So if you have any additional questions, go ahead and ask me. Um, and then once we are done with that, we can move on to more Jimny related stuff if you guys want to. Oh, this, this is my favorite place. This was Karma Rhino Sanctuary. Such an incredible place. It's just the light. You can't explain the light. It's just got this beautiful kind of golden quality. This is out in the Richtersfeld. Sensational. You can point your camera in any direction in the Richtersfeld and you will get an amazing shot. It's, it's, it's very cool. Isi Mangaliso, well, out in uh, Cozy Bay. Spectacular. My favorite place in the world. <laughs> this is out there in Makhadi Kari Pans by Kubu Island with Blaine. And another one. You know what, as much as I love filmmaking, I have a really soft spot in my heart for photography. It's my first passion, you know, it's my first source of income. It's everything for me. And, you know, what's been really nice is that nowadays I get to enjoy my photography way more than I used to because I'm not constantly pushing photography. I'll stop on the side of the road if I see a photo and I'm like, oh, that's the shot. And then I'll take it. I'm not having to shoot all day long. Sometimes I'll finish a day and only have 15 pictures but I'll have eight hours of footage. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Blaine Forster asks, shutter times on astrophotography. Okay, so this is what I'm going to say. Astrophotography is not a science. It's a formula. It's simple, okay? There are relation, certain relationships with certain things that are going to dictate your shutter speeds and stuff like that. But essentially, you're going to start off with an ISO of 1,600. Okay, you're going to need a camera that can shoot manual. And you're going to need a lens that can shoot between f2.8 and f1.4. Okay? The, the wider your lens can go, so the, the, lower, the smaller the number from 2.8 to 1.4, the better. But essentially, you're going to start at ISO 1,600, at f2.8, at 30 seconds. Is going to be your exposure okay the wider you can go on your aperture the brighter the image is going to be and the more stars you're going to pull out but ideally somewhere between iso 800 so if you have a f1.4 lens you can use iso 800 you don't have to use 1600 which means you're going to get a crisper image because you're going to get, le get less grain okay so there's things like that that's a, a kind of like pro tip for you it's not a, a crazy science to get good astrophotography it once you know how to do it you can you can do it so that's so you're going to start at about a, you know 30 second exposure. Um, if you're using a very high megapixel camera, you need to use a shorter exposure because obviously the pixels are tiny and the Earth is constantly rotating, so it's going to paint a little line with the stars. So the smaller your pixel, the more of a line it's going to paint. The, so which means the shorter the exposure. The bigger the pixel, the less megapixels you have, um, the the more the longer you can hold the shutter open because it's not going to paint a line. Okay. David Woods, is your YouTube videos covering the cost of your camera gear acquisition habit? No, sir, it is not. <laughs> it is not. This is, yeah, no, does not. Put it this way, I'll, I'll, I'll even be honest with you guys. A month, okay, a full month of YouTube 
at 400,000 views in a month, okay, is to maybe $300. That's what you get. So 400,000 views over a month, $300. That's what YouTube earns you. That is why people have things like Patreon. That is why people sell merch. That is why, because I can, you know, uh, that's why people, I mean, some live streams and stuff, people, you can donate in live streams. It's called Super Chats on YouTube. You know, there's things like that. That's why they implement all of these other revenue earning kind of platforms because you do not make enough money from YouTube ads. So anybody out there who's expecting to go out and they're going to make big money off of YouTube, think again. It's You have to really develop a, a, a kind of connection with your audience to the point where they trust you and they want to support you. And then they get to, onto something like Patreon and they donate towards every video you produce. I've got three amazing patrons at the moment because I used to have a Patreon that I cancelled and um, I no longer use because I just didn't feel like I could fulfill my promises on that. And it was a monthly donation. It wasn't per creation. So then people were paying every month, even though maybe I had a month where I didn't really make a video. So I, I just felt guilty. I was still working at my other job and things like that. And it just didn't feel right. So now I've made a new Patreon and that is now per video. You can donate $3, $5, $50, whatever. And you get other perks, like you get the wallpaper packs. Um, these live streams, after lockdown, these live streams are moving to Patreon. These are going to be Patreon only. So enjoy them now while they are, you know, available for everybody. But it's just going to be part of my move, moving towards going full-time on Rome Over Landing. I need to reward my patrons with something really significant, you know. And I think these live streams and having that kind of interpersonal connection is going to be really valuable going forward. So that is something that's going to be like quite cool. Um, yeah, and then, oh, plus the, so then, what settings you used? To, okay, so Robert Portolini, I hope I answered your question, answering Blaine's question. Um, and then 144 megahertz. The wider the focal length, the longer the exposure can be. Exactly, yeah. So I mean, you don't, sorry, I didn't explain that, but you don't want to shoot astrophotography unless you're shooting nebula and stuff like that with a long lens. You want to use something that is really wide. This lens is not a good example because it's not really a good astrophotography lens. It's not uh, a wide enough aperture. But you want to use something that's like 10 millimeters or 14 millimeters or, for example, on that one, 18 millimeters on a crop sensor that translates to about 24 millimeters, which is a really nice... I enjoy shooting astrophotography at about 24 millimeters. Um, yeah, I mean... And you know what the thing is? Uh, 144 megahertz, like you, you raise a valid point there with the star trails. You know, to do really impactful star trails, you have to leave your exposure open. I think it's um, four, five hours or 10 hours or something ridiculous like that um, to get really good quality star trails. Um, Double X Albatross, right now, 44 people here, but we only have 13 thumbs up. Please don't forget the thumbs. Ah, thanks for <laughs> reminding everyone. You know what the thing is? I'm, this is a very specific and targeted video. I, I don't expect everybody to like this video. I don't expect everybody. This is for the guys who this is valuable for. It's for them. It's, it's not for everyone. Um, but I know that I know that this is something that's important for people to kind of get a bit of perspective on. Um, James Feeney, if I donate five dollars through Patreon, how much of that do you actually see? Um, I, whew, gosh, that's a good question, man. <laughs> I'm not too sure on the cuts and stuff. Uh, I would assume I'd probably get like, I think they take 10 or 20%. I don't know. I think it's quite small. I think it's 10%. So I think I'll get $4 or $4.5, something like that. It's much better than YouTube. YouTube, um, so I actually saw last week I had two super chats, one from Blaine, right, and um, one from Sam. And they were, uh, the one was $20, Canadian dollars, and the one was... Um, 200, 200 rand, right? I only got 150 rand from each of those. So the Canadian dollar to rand is about 10 times. So they work out to about the same donation. So of that was supposed to be 400 rand, I get 350 or three, it was 300. So that's like 25%. So YouTube takes 25% of that donation. So it, it's almost better to do Patreon and donate through Patreon because I actually get a higher percentage as a creative. Um, and on the YouTube ads, YouTube takes half 
<laughs> How's that? So if I generate 10,000 rands worth of ads in a month, I only get 5,000. So it's pretty, it's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. Funny enough, what works really well is the merch. I get, I get, I do it through Teespring. They're the guys who did this hoodie. Um, and they, they're the international merch. So I have a local merch and I have international merch. Local merch, you just look on the store, you tell me what you want, and I'll get it made locally and ship to you locally. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's a bunch of stuff like that. But internationally, I actually make really good money off of selling merch. Um, you know, I think last, last, last month was some people bought some stickers and they bought some hoodies and some t-shirts and stuff like that. And, you know, that was about $65 profit. So, I mean, it's, it's not a lot, but it all adds up. If you have Patreon and it's Patreon's making you some stuff and then uh, you're selling a little bit of merch and you're making a bit of money from ads and then I'm picking up some free launch jobs here and there, it's enough to kind of keep me going, but it's definitely not flourishing amount of money, I'll be honest with you. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that kind of answers your question. Okay, so that is a lot of stuff. If there's anything, what else is there? I've covered cameras, I've covered lenses. I've covered gimbal, I've covered tripods, I've covered sound equipment, all of that stuff. I think that's pretty much everything. I've covered a little bit of lighting equipment. Um, is there anything else? We've covered drones. Uh, if there's anything else you guys want to ask about the photography and videography related stuff, let me know. Otherwise, we can, for the last little bit, transition over to some Jimny and overlanding related stuff if you guys are keen otherwise we can wrap this up because my word it looks like it is one hour and 47 minutes and I cannot believe you guys are still here <laughs> is it has it been that long it can't be that long half past eight no it can't be that long I don't know Juba yes yes sneaky just come in there right at the end hey what hard drives do you use to back up videos? We haven't covered computers, which is one of the most essential part of putting these videos together. <laughs> um, so Juba, I have three hard, four hard drives, okay? I've got two on the computer, two 500 gig SSDs. I have an external SSD, which is another 500 gigs. And then I have a one terabyte hard drive, which is in a ruggedized case that's waterproof, drop proof, everything, hurricane proof. So essentially what I'll do is the SSD is what I use to work on and I use the SSDs on the computer to work on. That one terabyte drive is what I dump stuff onto. Dumping, for you guys to know, it's not you know, going to the loo. It is copying footage from your camera onto your computer. It's called dumping. Okay, just in case you, <laughs> in case you guys wanted to know. Um, so essentially, hold on one second. Yeah. This little guy, little card, holds all the spare memory cards. What I'm doing, this camera can take two really big SD cards, okay? And it can film for 11 hours on 128 gigs, which is a really, 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 really long time, okay? If I'm going to get a, another ruggedized version of these SD card holders, which will also be waterproof, drop proof, everything, I'm going to just buy, these are really cheap memory cards. Um, I don't know if I have to hide my face. Okay, these are really cheap memory cards. I think they're 300, 500 Rand or whatever for 128 gigs. I'm going to buy six of them. <laughs> and I'm going to be able to film literally for days and days and days and days on end. And I can just put them in this little ruggedized case and at no point do I need to pull out my laptop and dump footage. And this can, it can record to two memory cards at the same time. So you can see here, it's got two card slots and it backs up live, backs up immediately while you're filming. So what I can do is I can record to both SD cards and essentially um, just take them at the end of the day, pop them in here and I'll have already backed up versions of it. Or I can have two of these cases, one hidden somewhere in the vehicle and one in my camera bag and um, split the cards so that they're in a safe place. If my camera equipment gets stolen, if my camera bag gets stolen, I still have all my footage hidden in the car. Or if my car gets stolen, I still have the, the footage in the camera bag. You know what I mean? So it kind of works like that. So, I mean, that's a good question to ask. And I think especially with um, traveling, you know, in, up into Africa and doing really long travels where you, the longer you travel, the further you are away from home, the more valuable those memory cards become. 
Okay, so, and just a recap on how everything is charged. Well, right now, <laughs> I'm actually using my, which I use often, I use this guy, my Flexo Power, because I've got three USB ports here and I've got uh, my big plugs. So I can, I can plug in, so for example, my other chargers are two prongs, so I can plug in the charger for the C100, I can plug in the charger for the 90D, I can plug in my microphones, my two little lapel microphones in here, and charge my gimbal, all at the same time, from this. Then, once that's done charging, I can then still use this to then power my two uh, Godox lights, because they're 60 watt lights, so I can plug one in here, and one in here, boom, Bob's your uncle, and I have like a portable production studio with that little pack. So that, I, I love that. I love having that. That's something that's very cool um, for me to have. Um, I see there was quite a little bit of spam going on there. Do you use a star tracker for the Astro? No, man, I don't, I don't go too fancy on Astro. I'm not a time lapse, like too crazy about time lapse. I do them for fun because I enjoy doing them. Mm. James, hitting with the hitting with the hard stuff there, hey? So how's the trailer research going? Guys, I have not had so many people tell me I should get a trailer ever in my life. That Jimny review video of mine, every second comment, actually probably every comment <laughs> has something to do about an off-road trailer. And I'm gonna lay it to you straight right here. The Jimny's rated towing capacity is 350 kilos unbraked. So either you tow a cardboard box or you have to tow a 750 kilo trailer with brakes. So you need to make that modification. Towing 750 kilos with a Jimny, I know Blaine has done amazing things towing with his Jimny. I personally would not want to necessarily do that. I don't know. I just, I need to try it, but I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, if I could find something that could fit within that 350 range, 350 kg range, I mean, think about it. You put in two jerry cans, that's 40 kilos. So that's two jerry cans of water, which you've taken from the roof on the back. Then you put on your rooftop tent, which is, um, oh, sorry, I see you guys are not getting enough, it says that you're not getting enough footage. But anyways, okay, then you put your rooftop tent, then you put your... Um, you know, you're, you want a battery, maybe you want a battery in there or something. It's never going to fit in 350 kilos plus a trailer. It's not going to fit. So, and I don't want a lightweight trailer. I want, if, the, if I'm going to put a trailer on the vehicle, it must follow that car wherever the vehicle goes. I never want the trailer to be like, oh no, I can't go there, I've got a trailer. I don't want that. So I want something like a Patriot camper trailer or something like that, that literally just wherever you point the car, that trailer follows you. And I just don't know if, you know, that is possible with the Germany. I just don't think so. I, I don't know. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. You guys can show me trailers that are better. You guys can show me things like that. Great. I will 100% look at them. I will 100% get in touch with trailer manufacturers to test the trailer. I'm open to changing my mind. But I don't think it'll happen. Um... Error, YouTube is not receiving enough stuff. Oh, that's not good, YouTube. Okay, well. Uh, so I see here, Big Red Pig SA. Namibia or Botswana, which one is better as a photographic destination? Ooh. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I haven't been to Namibia. But what I've seen, mm, looks incredible. I've been to the Richtersfeld, which is really close to Namibia. And that was um, sensational. So it is one of those things where it is, um, it's really tight. It's really close. It's really, really close. I think Namibia is so extreme. But Botswana has got something else, man. Botswana, you've got the wildlife that you've got in Botswana. It's the quantity of wildlife you have in Botswana. It's the, those sunsets in Botswana are just sensational, you know. Being out on the pans and things like that. I think that is incredible. But then you, you're talking Namibia and you've got the mountains and the rocks and the, the deserts out there. And it's just, I, okay, photo tour, Namibia. It's just so much. So many different things. You can go to the shipwrecks. You can go to the 
ghost town you can go to there's so many things you can do this so if you're going just for photos i rate namibia is pretty damn epic um but i mean botswana is pretty epic too but i think namibia uh, Dimitri, often I find nature na nature colors a bit dull, and I see that the f in finished production the images and videos are color enhanced. How do you feel about making your footage a bit artificially boosted color wise? Um, greetings from Bucharest, Romania, from Dacia Project. Look, Dimitri, I am a professional content creator. My job is about enhancing the footage. I don't do it in an incriminating way. I make it look and feel like it was when I was there. Maybe my, my kind of imagination embellishes it a little bit sometimes, but more often than not, nowadays, I just try and make it look as authentic as possible. And what happens more often than not is the camera cannot actually capture everything. You have to kind of push the camera to kind of have that same feeling. Our eyes are much better than cameras. Um, nice to see you, Dacia Project. Ubaid Gafar, when are you going to make another video due to the virus? Buddy, I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I've heard some rumors that production is um, unlocked now. I might be able to apply for a permit to be able to make videos. Who knows? But the locations where I need to travel to need to be open as well. You know, that's also important. Probably not off the shelf, to be fair. Uh, sorry, James, what is... Just, um, James, just, just explain uh, that comment to me a little bit, please. Um, if we'd like to tackle it. Uh, you're not supposed to cough on camera. Oh, no. I'm a human being. I get phlegm. <laughs> I also pop a squad in the bush, guys. Actually, somebody asked me a question about that on Instagram. They were like, I'm going to Botswana and there's no toilets where I'm going. What do I do? And my answer to you is you got to get comfortable digging a little hole and um, popping a squat, buddy. There is nothing more liberating than what's known in uh, South Africa as a boskak. It's pretty self-explanatory. It is a poo in the bush. <laughs> you only have to, you have to break the seal once. It's the, it's the stress of like, oh, I use a normal toilet all the time. What am I going to do in nature? Then you get out there, you do it once and you go, wow, that feels so natural. Why have I never done this before? Then once you've broken the seal, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> Can you do a free giveaway? I have had somebody get in touch with me about testing out some products. And what I've done is I've asked for another set of that product that I can do as a giveaway. So we'll see. They might very well be. Uh, Manzi Alain Pacific. Rumongi. Come on. Come on. I'm sure I, did. I'm sure I got that right. Hello, a uh, fan from Kigali, Rwanda. You should plan a trip in the country of a thousand hills. You don't understand. That's my goal. That's my goal. I want to go to Rwanda. I want to go see the gorillas in you in Rwanda and Uganda. That's my that's my goal, man. Um, you should go to the Western Cape. I've gone to the Western Cape plenty of times. Um, you can go and check my YouTube videos. You can see some of my Western Cape adventures. Um, please give a shout out. This is from Big Red Pig RSA. Please give a shout out to the usual suspects from Plettenberg Bay, big followers of your channel. Well, here's a shout out to the usual suspects from Plettenberg Bay. They're apparently big fans of the channel. <laughs> uh, my old man towed with his Jimny. Don't do it. Yeah, Simple Life Overlanding. I, there's things that the Jimny is designed for and there's things that the Jimny is not designed for. And in that video, I explained to you about why I just want to let the Jimny be what it needs to be you know for me if i was going to have that if i was going to keep that vehicle that is ideally what i'd like to do but it would mean sacrificing a lot of my dreams and desires and passions and for a lot of you that may want to know is i will be looking at selling the jimny in the near future so it is something that is going to be is going to be kind of coming up um i'll be honest with you first things first with the jimny before i sell it i need to finish the build so the gull wings are going to be installed um, the draw system is going to be finalized. The drop down table is going to be finalized. Everything's going to be on. And if I sell that vehicle, I'm selling it completely kitted out. Everything is completely kitted out. It's going as is rooftop tent, awning, um, the jerry can holders, the water tank, the light bars, the bumpers, every single thing except 
the internal components like the fridge and the dual battery system and stuff like that. So the wiring will be run for you to plug in your own dual battery system. The You'll be able to put in your own fridge on the drawers and stuff like that. So it'll be, you'll even get all the original bumpers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that's like how I will sell it, you know. Uh, it'll come with everything. So that's kind of, oh, Thomas H, keen for baboons pass. Yes, boy. I would love to do baboons pass. And I would love to do baboons pass in the gymney before I sell it but I'm scared I'll damage it. <laughs> I've heard the, the ridiculous stories of Baboon's Pass. But maybe I can do Baboon's Pass in the next vehicle. Who knows? That might be a cool uh, challenge. Um, Kevin Pinaglia. I remember you. <laughs> I like how you don't over-enhance your videos and photos. Being true is what matters. Well, look, I think there would be... Um, some people would uh, disagree with you on the photo side of things. I go quite extreme on the photos, but you know, you have to on social media because stuff gets lost. And if you do a, a this, I used to love doing these really subtle edits because it actually takes a lot of skill to do it properly, but it would just get lost on, on, by the time it's down sampled and rescaled for, for Instagram. Um, 144 megahertz, how funny. I remember that my elementary school had a partnership with schools in Rwanda and helped to build the education system. I should visit too. Yeah, you should visit. Beautiful country, man. How many miles on the Jimny? Um, I don't know miles, but kilometers is 33,000 kilometers. <laughs> 144 megas, Unimog next. Not a chance, not a chance. Am I going to do a Unimog? I would do a Sprinter van conversion. I would do, I would do that 100%. That would be awesome. But it has to be the 4x4 version. But again, that's also like 600 to a million rand. It's just like ridiculous. Um, I got to get going. Thank you for the live stream. Stay healthy. Thanks, Borderline Explorer. Thanks for tuning in and hanging around. It's good to see you around. Thomas H., let me know before. I'm keen to... Disco 2. Woo! I've heard, I've heard amazing things about the Disco 2s as like the ultimate four-wheel drive and the way you can mod those things. I better start saving them so I can buy your Jimny. How much, please? Um, well, Robert, I've got to have a look. I've got to have a look first. Victor Bart, Retro Machines. Two euros. Thanks, buddy, for buying. <laughs> that is the best I've ever seen. That is the, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen. If I did, yeah, I would. <laughs> if, if, what do I need? I just need 200,000 more people to donate two euros and we can buy a Unimog. <laughs> Uh, we've done a complete storage system for the Jimny. I was impressed with space. If you're clever about the design, happy to share pics if you're keen. Simple Life Overlanding. Yeah, man, you can always send me photos. You can share them on the iRoam group if you want to as well, if you want other people to see. Um, yeah, we're busy working. On, we've got our, our storage system that we're busy working on with Bush Tech. That's kind of been come a long way now. And um, we kind of just want to put the finishing touches on it. And there's obviously some other stuff that's coming in with the gull wings that's going to really kind of uh, revamp the way I use the Jimny for camping and the way other people would use their Jimny. So there's a lot of cool stuff coming along. Um, Rick Peterson, I completely agree that the Jimny's to towing capacity is really bad. Best thing to do is have another vehicle to carry all the luggage like a single cab Ranger, Hilux or Amarok. Yeah, roof. Hilux time. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, chatting to Simon from Rollboss today and um, I was saying, you know, the Hilux is a vehicle that I wouldn't particularly feel excited to own, but I know that it would do everything I ask of it really well. You know, it's one of those vehicles. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things to kind of think about. Um, hi, Con. Hey, Victor Bart, Retro Machines. I love that. I love retro retro machines. That's such a, such a great name. Uh, with fifteen thousand euro plus fifteen thousand for the build, you can have a pretty nice Unimog, one thousand three hundred liter daily four by four. Yeah, Eveco daily would be amazing. Blaine, I know you wanna you wanna use the moderator hammer on that guy. Um, one forty four megahertz. Uh, what I'm looking at one right now. $30,000 euro for a U435-13,000 ambulance from the German army. Wow. Okay, but then how much will it cost to get that? So just for perspective, 
So 30,000 euros is 600,000 rand. Then I've got to get it to South Africa. Then I have to drive it around and pay for all the fuel. So it's, it's so expensive, guys. We don't, we live in Africa. You guys need to remember that. Uh, Africa, your money is not worth much. Well, your money is worth lots if you're from Europe and from America and stuff, then you're great. Um, how do you deal with security threats, especially militia terrorists? Oh, Julius Ogutu. Well, I mean, we don't really have uh, militia and terrorists and stuff in Southern Africa. It's more of a North Eastern African problem and like really far North Africa. But I don't really think uh, it's, um, it's not really a problem down here. You have other things to worry about. You've got a lot of petty crime to worry about in, Southern, in, in South Africa. I won't say Southern Africa. I think um, places like Namibia and Botswana and stuff are really safe. And I've heard good things about Zambia and Malawi and, and Tanzania and Kenya and stuff like that. Um, mixed bag on Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Um, but I think Mozambique's pretty, pretty, pretty safe. Swaziland's really safe. Lesotho's pretty safe. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know the, the kind of harassment you get when you go to a lot of places is um, you'll get kids running towards the car asking for sweets. It's kind of creepy. You'll have, like, literally, like, driving through Lesotho, they'll hear, it, like, your, the diesel engine or the motor of the car, and they'll come running down the mountains shouting, sweeties, sweeties, sweeties. And if you don't give them sweets, they start throwing rocks at your car. It's quite, it's because people came there and they were like, oh, look at these kids. We're going to give them candy. And it's just like, it's like, yeah, it's, it's just not good. It's not good to do that kind of stuff. Go into somebody else's place and like interfere with their, the way they live. And then they become dependent on that and they, they love, they just want sweets. <laughs> so it's very d tricky to, to kind of fight that. Um, you can drive it from Germany to SA. Perfect test drive. I think you are, you're spot on the money, bud. I just need a lot more euros and then I can do it. But also, I mean, think about it, guys. What's going to happen now with international travel with this whole COVID-19 thing? Realistically, you know, I, I foresee a lot of people doing a lot of local travel. Um, I, don't, I don't know when, you know, this international travel is actually going to open up. A lot of people are really scared. Uh, and, it, and it makes sense, you know. I think South Africa is going to be under lockdown for quite a while. Now, there's these big SUVs, and they can't do a fraction of what a small car can do. Look, they're made for different purposes, though, you know? Like, a Land, Land Cruiser 200, I've seen them do incredible things on 4x4 courses that the Jimny can do as well. But a Land Cruiser 200, bet your bottom dollar, you're going to be way happier on a really long drive and on a really long tour in a Land Cruiser 200 versus a Jimny. It's just fact. You know, bigger vehicles are more stable on the road. They've got more comfort and capacity and all of those things. You know, there are perks to having bigger vehicles. But where a bigger vehicle really sucks is now you've got to drive that big thing around town. You've got to go to the grocery store and park in the tiny parking bay where some guy's parked like an asshole and he's over the line. And, you know, then things become really stressful. Now you've got this big, beautiful vehicle and, you know, it's just, ugh, you have a panic about it. And I think that's something that, you, you struggle to live with. And the reality is, is that most people use their 4x4s 90% of the time on road around town, you know. And that is something where the Jimny really excels because it's great around town. Uh, it's, it's all right on the highway. It's really, it's, well, it's, it's very acceptable on the highway. But it's fantastic off-road doing like little mountain trails and things like that. That's just like really where it shines. But it, it's not a burden to have driving around town, you know. And that's something that we, it, it like fits this really nice little niche. Look, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I think I'll give you guys like two more minutes to ask any emergency questions if you have any. But we are over an hour and a half now. And yeah, I think it is time to call it for the day. I hope I managed to answer a lot of your questions about the kind of equipment that I use. I hope I got to kind of inspire you a little bit to, to be confident that you don't really need that much stuff to go out there and make beautiful films. It's really about your passion. It's really about your skill and things like that. And the most important thing is just to get out there and keep making stuff. And that is the most important thing, guys. 
And 20 de Toy says, how's it, buddy? I fully agree with you. Every 4x4 is unique in its own way. 100%. And on that bombshell. Oh, no. Now there's more people tuning in. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. On that bombshell, we're going to be wrapping up. So thank you so much for joining, guys. I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next Monday. We'll do another live stream. If you guys have any particular topics you want me to chat about, you can get in touch with me on Instagram. You can get in touch with me on the iRoam group on Facebook. You can pop me an email. You can head to my website and contact me through there. There's so many ways you can get in touch with me. I try and respond to everything. The best way to get in touch with me is on the iRoam group. Post some photos there. Write something. Ask a question, whatever. I'll get in touch with you. Other roamers will get in touch with you. It's a really nice kind of platform and a nice place to, for everyone to chat. And it guarantees me seeing your comments and things like that. It's very difficult to see everyone's comments on YouTube and Instagram and things like that. Okay. So thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Have a great week ahead. And um, yeah, hopefully this lockdown situation doesn't last too much longer. Thanks. Cheers, guys.